Okay. We're live. Go ahead. you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against what could stand against our God our God is greater our God is strong Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? could stand against. Good morning, New Life. This is the time we, we give a call to worship. It's right for us to call the people of God, us to worship God. And I'm going to do it today from uh, 1 Samuel 2. This is Hannah's prayer. So this is the, the word of God, but also the word of a, of a woman and a new mother exalting our God. If you're able, will you please stand for this call to worship? Hannah said this, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like you, Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Let us worship.
we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship him now how great how awesome is he and together we sing everyone sing
praise and glorify our God, for we believe the word. And through our faith we have a seal, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done. Until we join in endless praise to God, the three in one. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Amen. Let's bind our hearts together as I read this prayer from Psalms. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of, and the number of my days. Let me now let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. Surely, everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain, they rush about, keeping up their wealth, heaping up their wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. We are a moment, you are forever, Lord of the ages, God before time.
You might have been wondering uh, what Youth Ministries has been up to. We have been meeting each week on Zoom, both the Junior High, Senior High, and Connect. And this last week, we had an opportunity to recognize our graduating seniors. Um, you know these students. You taught them in kids' life. Uh, you watched them grow up right here um, at, at New Life. And we gathered uh, on Zoom last week to celebrate God's goodness to them. And an important part of this celebration is what we call the senior video. And we want to share that with you in just a moment. This is an opportunity to see how these students have grown from when you first met them as babies uh, up to the young men and women who are ready to head off to college um, in the fall. Ordinarily, uh, we'd have them here and we would pray for them. We would invite them up to pray for them. Uh, but we just can't do that this morning. So after the video, Mark will come and pray. But I hope uh, that you'll join us in your house in praying for our students. The other thing before we watch the video I should say is that we also love to say goodbye to departing leaders in the senior video. So you at the very end will see um, our tribute to Dave Hopping as, uh, as he has now left us and is um, pastoring at New Life Dresher. So enjoy the senior video. Let's stay up all night, all night, all night, all night, all night. All night, all night, all night, all night, all night. We're gonna make a memory last at least till morning. Just take all night, all night, all night, all night, all night. So let's take all night. are my favorite well these are my favorite 
days And you are my favorite So these are my favorite days What a great video, and I want to pray for the graduates here in a moment, but let me say this to you graduating seniors. If you need anything the next year, contact us. Reach out. Uh, contact someone you know in this congregation, maybe Jason, maybe your D group leader, maybe me, whoever you feel comfortable with. We are here for you. You are family. We will not forget you, so we are here. Uh, can we pray now, all of us together, for these high school graduates? Lord, we do pray as they enter this next phase, so many of them moving away and living on their own for the first time. Would you bless them, Lord? Would you give them strength? Would you protect them? Would you enable them to find your people? We pray that they would find your people, fellow students on campus, and that they would plug in, and that they would grow, that they would grow in adulthood. It's not easy growing up. It is not easy in this world to grow up. Would you please protect them and assist them in every way? We thank you for our senior high, and we pray that it would be able to, they, they hate to move on and, and say goodbye, but of course, this is what they do. So I help our leaders to, to sadly uh, move on, and uh, we, we pray for the eighth graders coming up into ninth grade too. And uh, we do pray uh, for, for Dave and we think of Devin, too. And, uh, but for Dave, as he's moving on, uh, bless him again, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I will get to the uh, offering here in a moment. I'd rather dive into announcements right now. We have a few announcements. Uh, first one is the corporation meeting. We have to delay that a couple weeks. So now it is June 28th, not today, to be honest. We just discovered it was more complicated to do this kind of thing on the internet than we thought. So give us a couple of weeks here and we'll do it. And that's for uh, the budget and for trustees to approve those things. Uh, prayer, please come at four o'clock today, if you're able, in the parking lot. Uh, we're going to pray. This is actually our, our, our typically scheduled bi-monthly church prayer meeting. We're just doing it outside and we're going to pray for a, a number of things. So this is wide ranging. And we'll be sitting in chairs. Please bring chairs and wear masks and six feet apart, uh, if you could, for social distancing, physical distancing. I still like that better. Uh, and uh, we were going to be seeking the Lord's face together. Third, I want to talk about the Red Cross blood drive just briefly. This is tomorrow, 2 to 7 p.m. You can see the contact information there. Uh, please be considering this, if you could donate. And the New Life Thrift Store, finally, it has reopened for business in both locations, both Melrose and in Glenside. Uh, so like all businesses or many businesses, it was closed for a while and it's now reopened. And uh, thank you to Dave Channing and the excellent staff for all the work there and how they do great work to bless the community in many ways. Well, this time I'd like to invite up Dave Downs to tell us a little bit about what the deacons and deaconesses are up to. So this is the Deacons Minute. Good morning. I'm here today to try to get you all up to date on how the coronavirus pandemic and associated economic repercussions have impacted the functioning of the diaconate and the food cupboard. The deacons are now meeting every two weeks online from home instead of monthly in person. Like most businesses in the area, the thrift store had to close in mid-March, cutting off approximately 80% of our funding for Mercy and Counseling Ministries. Even though we entered this period with a financial cushion sufficient for six to nine months at normal spending levels, we decided to cut back once again 
on our support for people outside the church, with exception of the food cupboard, and focus our, on our primary calling to meet the mercy needs of the church family. So far, the deacons have been presently, pleasantly surprised by the low level of increased financial need coming from the congregation. But please, if you are in need, please speak to a deacon before it becomes an emergency. The pandemic has caused a number of challenges for the food cupboard, all of which have been met by the grace of God through the hard work and generosity of the staff and volunteers from the congregation and Greater Glenside. The contagiousness of the virus and social distancing requirements have necessitated that the food be pre-bagged and distributed in the parking lot. This required volunteers for traffic management and preparing bags, lugging them up the stairs and out to the cars. The various weaknesses in the national food distribution network that were exposed by the pandemic also caused the inventory <coughs> at Phil Abundance to decline, to decline first to one sixth of normal and then to nearly nothing severely limiting our ability to restock by our primary supplier. <clears throat> also, horror of horrors, the post office food drive was canceled. We've also had to distribute non-traditional items such as toilet paper. To remedy this and other things, Tuesday, we started Tuesday and Saturday food drives in which the church and outside community came to our rescue. These required more volunteers to receive, sort, and box of donated food. The particular needs this week are rice, jelly, and canned fruit for Saturday's food drive. We are even buying eggs every other week from a farm in Telford. The community also responded through food drives of their own. The Abington police and Abington teachers, for example, had food drives. And there was even a pet food drive at a pet shop in Winmore. All these activities are organized and coordinated by Bridget Franklin and Sally Andrake. Another example of God's provision during this time has been the amazing financial support we have received. Contributions to support the food cupboard in, es in excess of $13,000 have been received from individuals inside and outside the church, including significant grants from the Philadelphia Foundation and the Rotary Club. Only the Lord knows how long we'll need to continue like this. So there will be plenty of opportunities to serve going forward. And please, once again, if you are in need, please speak to a deacon before it becomes a dire emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And, and can we pray right now uh, for the offering, including deacon's offering? I'll, I'll explain here in a moment, but let us pray. Lord, we pray that the deacons and deaconesses would continue to do what they do well, love people in need, physical and material need. And even the offerings today and, and certainly the offerings to the food cupboard, we pray would help them and would glorify you. Amen. This is the second Sunday of the month, and I, I don't know if you know, the second Sunday of the month is when we do communion. And it's when we pass around a second uh, basket for, uh, for the offering. Now, that second basket uh, is for the deacons, for the things we, we just heard about. And uh, I just want to say on that, when we get to the, the moment here of giving online, look for the pull-down menu on when you, when you actually give. You can choose where it goes to, and you'll see the, answer, the option for our deacons. This is also, as I just said, a communion Sunday, typically. We haven't done that in a while. I'm missing it. I wonder if you are, too. I want to encourage you. We, we just really started discussions about how can we do this again? How can we do communion? Uh, maybe next month. Uh, if you saw my email this week, we're, we're starting to re-enter into worship or regather together with our first phase, June 28th. That's two Sundays from today. So read that email and you'll see more emails coming out describing uh, what exactly our plan is. Uh, but we're hoping to return to uh, the Lord's Supper as soon as possible. And I'm, re I'm reminded of that today. Uh, we are going to go into a break time. And as break time is a time for you to be able to stretch your legs and, 
and also give online, perhaps. And I want to also say uh, the, the sign-in button. It's like passing around the black welcome pads. If you could uh, hit the sign-in button on that page that you're, you're looking at right now, and let us know you're here. That helps us out too. And uh, finally, this might be a time to text someone because this is usually meet and greet time, right? Uh, so how about this for your uh, assignment today if you choose to accept it? Uh, how about you text someone associated with senior high? Maybe a graduating senior to encourage them. Maybe Jason or one of the volunteer leaders or, or you could go down to junior high too. How about you text someone associated with our youth ministry?
as we go into prayer this morning, one of the things we're encouraging you to do this summer is to pray the Psalms. And we started that in the first Psalm that we went through, Psalm 42 and 43 last week. And what we mean by that is I want you, we want you to take a Psalm, each one that we've, we go through this summer, and read it through in its entirety. And then go back and read each verse and then paraphrase it with respect to what you're going through, what's on your heart, and then pray your words back to God. And in this way, you make the psalm what the psalms are, which is how we speak to God about our hearts as we worship him. So I'm going to do that this morning with one verse from Psalm 42 from last week. Verse 6, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning as a people who constantly need to put our hope in you. There are so many things we, we do hope for, Lord, and many of them are such good things. But we do not have the power to make these things happen on our own. And so we wait and we trust in you. And Lord, we confess that our weak hearts are too willing to give up. And we easily slip into discouragement and even despair as the things we hope for seem to fade away. But you, Lord, do not fade away. Even your silence draws us to yourself. You have given us your, your Holy Spirit so that we would not live as orphans. You dwell with us, Lord. Even when we feel alone, when we wrestle with our doubts about what you're doing in our lives, we are never alone. For as the psalmist says, you are my salvation and my God. You want our hearts, Lord, so teach us through the psalms in whatever situation in which you have placed us to put our hope in you. Would you give us eyes to faith to continue eyes of faith to continually believe that you are at work even when we cannot see you? And then we ask, Lord, that you would give us glimpses of what you are up to, so that we might, like the psalmist says, again praise you. For you are our God and our salvation. Lord, we especially want to pray for those who have lost loved ones recently, that they too would put their hope in you as they grieve. Help them to grieve with hope, Lord. We especially think of Tanya and her family on the passing of her son, of their brother, and for Eli as he has lost his father. We pray, Lord, that their hope is in you for the future resurrection to come, we pray for peace and safety in that home. And we pray for Cindy, too, Lord, who, pray, who lost her mother a couple of weeks ago, and we ask that she, too, would find in you her hope for every day going forward. We pray for those who are ill, Lord, and those who are most vulnerable to this um, illness that is sweeping the world, and we ask for your protection over them. We pray especially for those going through cancer, and we think of Rick and Chris. Give them strength and also hope for future health, Lord. We keep praying for that with them. And we thank you that Miska and her treatments for cancer are now in the past and that she is doing well. What a mercy she has received from her and her family. We pray, Lord, for those who are uh, older in our congregation, we ask that a special protection would be upon them. And we pray for those with chronic, ongoing uh, physical and mental disabilities, Lord. Life is hard for them. And we ask, Lord, that you would be close and dear to them. And we pray for their caregivers as well who walk with them um, on and on. And, and Lord, we we pray for those in assisted living facilities who nowadays are even more vulnerable. And we think of our, our sisters, Mariah and Marcy and Peggy and Rita. Oh, Lord, we ask uh, that every one of these people would know you as their God, their Father. 
and give them the hope they need to live each day with praise and even joy in the midst of their circumstances. Lord, we pray for our government leaders. Now more than ever, we need them, Lord. Would you give them wisdom, wisdom to make wise decisions that will bring us together, give us greater understanding, and that you would bring this nation together, Lord, uh, in ways that we need to be brought together, not pulled apart. We pray that this turmoil would be a time for the gospel the hope of the reconciliation, not only between man and God, but between all human beings. Only the gospel is capable of doing this. And we pray that this Lord would rise to the surface and bring hope to our world and our nation. Lord, we pray for those who have lost jobs, um, so many in our country, and we ask, Lord, that you would provide for them both with ongoing work, new work, and with income, Lord. Keep them from discouragement and despair as they wait for you to provide. We ask that you lift up the leaders of this church, the session that meets weekly, the deacons that will meet mon Monday. Give us wisdom to shepherd this congregation. Give us wisdom as we think about how do we roll out with safety and protection a way in which we can physically come together again. We are thankful for the restrictions being eased, Lord, but give us safety and wisdom as we approach them. And uh, Lord, we pray uh, for all the ministries of the church, kids life, youth ministry, community groups, outreach. Um, it's, it's harder now, Lord, to do our normal ministry work and we pray that you would continue to give us a passion in the midst of all this dislocation, um, that we would teach and live out the hope that is found in you alone. We pray for those serving in the military all over the world. We pray for Jess and Phil, John and Tom, Shane, Luke, Natalie, Emma, and Ben. Protect them, Lord, and enable them to serve with equity and justice. And Lord, right now, uh, we need to hear your word. Would you make it, Lord, like water to thirsting souls? For that's us. Give us a thirst for your word. Give us a thirst for your word that helps us to see you more clearly and obey you and follow you and delight in you. And so I pray for my brother Mark that you would give him delight and joy as he works through your word for our benefit and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. So I'm told that you've been seeing on your screen, sit down and be quiet. That's the sermon title, actually. <laughs> Unforced error up here. I thought about calling it sit down and shut up. So that was a good call not to go that way. The scripture reading this morning is going to be Psalm 62. Uh, this, is, this is an old friend for me. This is a, a passage of scripture that has... Uh, been helpful for me on a number of occasions in life and given me words to pray to my Father. So I, I hope that this will be the same for you, whether it's an old friend or a, a new one. So Psalm 62, listen to God's word. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly, they curse. 
For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. Here ends the reading of God's word. My friend Nelson Shane is a general contractor. I think that means that he is not a specialist with one narrow area of concentration. It means that Nelson can do a lot of things. And uh, I have sometimes envied him. He doesn't know this. I have sometimes envied him his slogan, his catchphrase. Who else has a catchphrase? Which he has had printed on hats. And I think that was at least at one time on the side of his truck. One call does it all. One call does it all. It even rhymes, right? Nelson is boldly putting out there for the world to see the idea that whatever you need somebody to do, he can do. Look no further. He's the guy. Why does that make me envious? You know, because I am acutely aware that there are a lot of things that I cannot do. If you want to renovate your kitchen, yeah, I'm not your guy. If your hot water heater has exploded, don't call me. These are things that I am not competent to handle. Some of us are more broadly competent than others. But all of us, without exception, have the things that we do well our particular area of expertise, of knowledge and skill. And we get pleasure and satisfaction at being the go-to person for that something. It feels good to be the man who you know will do it well. Right? To be the woman who can get it done right. I want to be thought of as competent and able. Right, don't you? I, I want to be able to manage this, whatever this is. I want to have people's confidence. But then we fail. Sometimes we fall badly short, not only at the things that we knew we couldn't do, but even at the things that we are supposedly good at. And uh, friends, that is a source of shame, actually. Don't look at me. Don't notice. Don't say anything. I know I dropped the ball in spectacular fashion. And I'll tell you a secret. Even Nelson, right? He says, one call does it all. If you are looking for someone to give piano lessons to your little daughter, don't call Nelson. 
if you need a root canal, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Even Nelson comes to the end of his competency. This is a season, obviously, of out-of-control events that are completely beyond our ability to manage. I cannot manage a worldwide pandemic. I cannot neatly resolve in an afternoon or in a lifetime 400 years of deeply rooted violence against black people in America. And we, all of us, have the out of our control in our own personal worlds. The pain of a, a shattered relationship, maybe a, a family life torn by abuse or infidelity, a child whom you are watching going down a path of ruin while you look on helplessly, maybe a, a, a personal financial collapse that you cannot fix now. Or even, even just the normal Tuesday afternoon overwhelm that could have happened last year. The, the normal afternoon overwhelm of the daily details of stress and disappointment, ill health and ordinary sadness, that even those things, I feel like I cannot manage life. This psalm takes us to a place where we are looking for salvation, right? Or a more ordinary, everyday word, looking for help. This is a psalm that gives words to the person who needs a way of escape, who needs rescue, who has landed in a place where competence has run out, where every other resource has run out, where the conclusion has been nearly reached that you are out of options. The only deliverance, if there is to be any deliverance, must come from outside. What kind of salvation are we looking for here? And I want to encourage you not actually to jump too fast to Salvation capital S to what you may know of big picture Christianity, the categories of sin and death and judgment, heaven and hell. We'll get there, but not yet. For right now, I want to encourage you to be in the setting of the psalm, right? to assume the voice of the psalm, which is primarily a this physical world in this moment prayer. Not something abstract or philosophical, but a prayer in time and space. I'm in trouble. And I can't see through to the end of it. I am in it. What's that trouble like? Uh, well, as to the details, right, in, uh, in, in the breadth of our community, there's tremendous variety. But again, right, this is a time when we as a community share our trouble more than usual. When we as a community share our need for help. This virus is still a thing. And barring an unusual intervention of God, it will continue to be a thing for some months at least. We are going to continue to live in disruption in a time of tremendous volatility and unpredictability. I can't begin to tell you what's going to happen next week. People are going to continue to get sick, and some of them are going to die. And uh, it will be a time of ongoing danger to people you love. We share that together. And we also share the collective anguish of our nation over the burden of our shared history and of the present manifestations of its legacy of racism. Right. But there is, too, the particularity of your specific trouble in all its detail that you know better than anybody else. This psalm gives us some imagery that helps us to understand it and, and really articulate. And this is what the psalms do. They give us words to express things, 
to articulate the nature of the salvation that our hearts call out for. It, it gives us some delicious language, right? Perfect language that speaks to my heart's need. What do I need? I need a rock. I need a refuge. I need a fortress. And you hear those words, and it's just like, yes, that's it. Oh, please. I need a rock. Give me something, please, to stand on, something to build on, something that is not at any moment going to give way under my feet, right? Because there are seasons like this one, personal and also societal, when things give way, right? Things evaporate that you didn't think were temporary. And the fear becomes then, what if everything in my world is less stable and more temporary than I thought. Right? So, and Psalm 40 says, He gave me a firm place to stand. Oh, yes, Lord, give me a rock. And then there's this language of fortress, refuge. They're complementary words, right? And, and each of them evoke something with just a shade of meaning different from the other. What does a fortress promise me? It promises me strong, high walls, 50 feet high, 10 feet thick. It offers me an army of archers around the rooftop and a moat full of crocodiles and me inside, right? This is a place where no one can get me. What is the adjective? that goes with a fortress. Impregnable. Impenetrable. You think you can get me here? Good luck with that. Refuge, to me, as I say, is synonymous with fortress, but maybe just a, a, a shade different, right? Re refuge to me means there are people on my tail who are in pursuit of me. And I've got to get to a place of safety. So I, I think of playing tag as kids, right? That desperate sprint to get to base ahead of the kid who is it, right? To get your hand on that swing set before he gets his hand on your back. And if you can do that, ha, huh, you can breathe. You can't tag me here. It's against the rules. I'm safe here. And so you are until enough time has gone by that the other kid can reasonably call one, two, three, get off my father's apple tree, which sends you back in a world of danger. Proverbs 18, verse 10. This is lovely. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Now, you can relate to that, as we often do, by making it abstract, right? It, it can be personification, right? All this stuff in my life, it feels like I'm being attacked on all sides by bills and illness and people who want something from me. Right? You, you can feel pursued by your sins and chased by your anxieties. And all of that is legitimate. Right? It, it's evocative language. You can resonate with the language in that way. But uh, do you know what? In the original prayer, I don't think it's personification. In two seasons of his life, David, the writer of the psalm, had to literally flee for his life from people who wanted to kill him. It is not faceless opposition, but it, it's opposition with a very human face from people who have set themselves up as enemies. The 
Some of you know what that's like. Right? Somehow, you're not sure how it happened, but you have an enemy. Someone who is opposed to you, who is actively trying to do you harm. Maybe even within your own family. This is also what it feels like for black and brown men and women in our nation. A sense that actual people with faces and names have for generations been stubbornly opposed to their equal humanity, to their dignity, and to their physical safety. And there have been occasional glimpses of who these people are where, where the faceless mask, mass cr crystallizes for a moment to the face of Derek Chauvin of the Minneapolis Police Department. Right? Or Greg and Travis McMichael who attacked Ahmaud Arbery while he was jogging on a road in Brunswick, Georgia. Right? And it becomes not just an abstraction, but men with faces and names. And, and you may want to ask these men, why? Why have you set yourself to be my enemy, to delight in violence against my people? How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? One other way to, to give you an approach to this language of attacking enemies, we live in a world that has both a seen reality and an unseen one. Right? It's so possible to forget this. We often don't think of it. But friends, you have an enemy with a face and a name. You have enemies who want very much to see your ruin, who want to see you undone, your life in tatters, your soul diseased and embittered and lost. It's real. First Peter 5, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is part of your world, the reality that you inhabit. Verse 3 gives us to what, what I think is such, just such a perfect metaphor for us in our state of need, like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. Right? This wall, this fence is you. And it's not what it used to be, right? Push on it just a little bit. Get a strong breeze and over it goes. Just needs a little encouragement. What do you think of that image for yourself? Wobbly, vulnerable, fragile. How, how does that go down? And this together, right? The, the reality of attacking enemies and the reality of my own fragility adds up to the danger, verse, verse 2, verse 6, that I will be shaken. That when trouble comes, I will not stand up under it. Like the song about the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, that when the rains come down and the floods come up, the house on the rock goes splat. Right? That, that in the, the fear that in the midst of your trouble, whether big societal trouble or big personal trouble or even everyday trouble, the fear is on some level, am I going to go splat? Will I be shaken? And so I'm looking for salvation looking for the rock, the refuge, and the fortress. The next question is, can I help myself? Right. Can I muster a way out of this trouble? Can I save myself? And the psalmist says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. And People, you know, are, are by nature activists, problem solvers, circumstance manipulators. What do I have to do to help myself? Is that wrong? No, not, not entirely. But and, right, passivity is not a good thing as a general rule. Sometimes God calls you to do something difficult, something you need courage to do, and cowardice holds you back. Cowardice is not a virtue. 
But there is something here, something that you and I must hear today, a word from God that says, do not be an activist. Do not be frenetic. Do not imagine that for the deepest, most important matters of life, or really even the ordinary stuff of life, that you are competent to handle things. Sometimes there is a need to hear, no, you are fragile. You are not up to the job. You are weak. Face the music, hear this wisdom. Remember, rehearse it over again. Verse 9, you are but a breath. You are mortal, and you are temporary. Even if you are a somebody in this world with a bank account and a resume and a little bit of power, understand this, that you are a delusion. The idea that you have some leverage, some ability, in the deeper waters of human life and existence to exert a little influence That idea is false. It's not true. Face this music too, verse 10. Put no trust in extortion. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Right? There is this widespread belief, I think we all believe it to one degree or another, it's hard not to buy into it, that if I can get money by whatever means, right, honestly or dishonestly, That will be, for me, a buffer against the day of trouble. And uh, trouble go away. It's true. But against trouble with a capital T, it is completely overmatched. So, So the wisest thing for human beings to do is this. Despair of your own ability to handle life. Instead, wait in silence for God. Sit down and be quiet. Cast your eyes in the direction of God and stay there. And now we are in the territory of both lowercase s salvation, but also capital S salvation. Because you and I, we have worse trouble than just painful circumstances or even societal injustice, not to diminish either of those. But there is also this, that God is a holy God, and that I am a sinner. That the trouble of the world comes not just from other people, but also from me. And that when God brings justice, that I sit, not just in the place of the one who needs deliverance, but also in the place of the one who will be brought to account for my actions. And there, more than anything, we're brought to a place where we cannot help ourselves. Competence has run out. There are no resources. There's nothing we can pull together that will make the slightest difference in our plight. It is a desperate situation. And salvation, if it will come at all, must come from outside. The Bible tells many stories of God's help in the midst of trouble. The book is full of them. But at the climax of it all, the Lord addresses not just the myriad sufferings and oppressions and anguish of life, but at last, finally, he also addresses the capital T trouble. And he does that in his son, the Lord Jesus. What's the message of Christ? The message is, friends, that salvation comes not from within you, but from outside. Even his name, the name of this man Jesus, means the Lord saves. And this is what he does now. As Christ enters into our trouble, as he now receives in his own body the the onslaught of the attack of evil men and all the powers of hell, and he is shaken. He is undone. He is unraveled. The leaning wall goes splat. And his enemies gloat. And 
then out of that ruin comes life. And sinful men and women are given the perfect remedy to address our capital T trouble. What's the remedy? Romans 3.21, but now a righteousness from God, not from myself. Apart from law has been revealed this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. It's a salvation that has come from outside. It, it comes from God. The ability to be considered righteous, which means here, I think, just to be considered fundamentally, absolutely, irrevocably okay in the eyes of God. What do you need to do to be okay? You know what? Not much. Sit down and be quiet. Despair of yourself. Give up on any and all efforts to make yourself okay in any other way and instead cast yourself completely on Christ and on the mercy of God. That's the big message. The big salvation story, the one that I hope is or will be very soon, defining of your life. But what about lowercase trouble? Because that has not gone away. And, and I don't mean still by calling it lowercase trouble that it is not also deadly serious, right? But folks, the counsel of this psalm is, let this posture sit down and be quiet. Let it be the posture in some way of your life. The pattern of your ultimate salvation is also the pattern for dealing with the trouble of this world. It's not cowardly passivity, not disengagement. By all means, do boldly what he gives you to do. But let your life be marked by a deliberate, intentional, active quiet of your soul that looks primarily and continually in dependence on God to do the things that you cannot do. Second Corinthians 1, let me close here. Paul is recounting a list of the tremendously difficult things that he has been living through. This is what he says, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Here it is. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Here is the great thing about trouble, the great potential of trouble in your life. Trouble wakes you up to the reality of your inability to handle life. It wakes you up to your incompetence and makes you aware in your daily, hourly existence that the help you need today must come from outside. And this is what God is graciously doing for us now in this season. He is after your self-reliance. He is dismantling your self-reliance. That is an act of great grace. It is hard to let him do that. But you know what? Let it go. Let it go. Sit down and be quiet and look to the Lord for every need, for your ultimate salvation and for your help today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that uh, you are our rock and our salvation. And I pray today that you would deliver powerfully by your Holy Spirit these words to, to everyone who listens. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. I pray for a deep knowledge of that 
a deep joy and a, a readiness to, to give up on self-reliance and to wait for you. In Jesus' name, amen. King of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. Words of power strong to say that will never pass away. I will stand on every promise of And on this I am secure, and I'll stand on every promise of your word. When I stumble and I sin, condemnation passing in, I will stand on every promise of your word. of your word through this dark and troubled land you will guide me with your hand as I stand on every promise of your word and you promise to complete every work begun in me so I'll stand Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. And we'll stand on every promise of your word. Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe, right? This is God's posture toward you. Receive the Lord's blessing. Wish I could look you in the eye when I do it, but I kind of know where you sit, so visualizing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.